Hello, hello. Welcome to the Palba Show. Today, my guest is Dylan Wheeler. Dylan is a serial entrepreneur with a passion for using technology to benefit humanity. Welcome, Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Dylan, I wanted to have you on the show because we both share a passion for the future of technology, namely the metaverse. And there's a lot of buzz around the metaverse. Um, it does not have a firm definition, but the vision of it is a 3D immersive world where we will be spending a lot of time socializing, working, entertaining, learning, and more. And it's a combination of virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, gaming, social media, and much more. I don't like, is there anything you would like to add to that? Yeah, no, 100%. I think more broadly for me when I think of like the metaverse and like what that means is it's almost just like the next step of what we've been doing for like the past what like 20 or 30 years or so um, where if you think about you know a lot of um, jobs these days especially even right now like think about this podcast for example like we're both in two completely different places in the world and we're connecting right now through in this case it's just a two-dimensional you know zoom screen on my computer which is like kind of immersive. Like I can see you and you can see me and we can talk in pretty much real time. And so like, it works pretty good. Um, but I, I mean, it's, it seems kind of silly to think that like, it's just going to stop there. Right. Um, and so what you're seeing now is you've got companies like Meta kind of pioneering this, but also, you know, it, the idea has been here for a long time where as these devices get better, we can almost create more and more realistic experiences with each other. And even today, I think about my, my day job, I work completely online, completely remotely with all my other developers. And sometimes we hop into like a Slack, you know, group chat or something. Um, but I can certainly see a future not too far away where we're just jumping into some virtual space and then we're pulling up like a virtual whiteboard and we're like looking at each other and like, you know, body movements and like raising our hand and stuff like in real life. Like I, I could definitely see that eventually being simulated in some sort of like Zoom group chat situation. That's actually already happening. That's how we host Metaverse Think Tank meetings. We all hop into a workspace and there is a whiteboard um, and there's like a learning curve. Uh, it mm -hmm. makes eye contact really interesting. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, okay, so this can all be like really exciting, but I can't help but wonder what the ethical implications of this massive move forward would be. Like, what are some ethical barriers you think we as a whole of humanity will face as the metaverse progresses? Because like, like I mentioned, it makes things like eye contact really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are no, no eyes, are... Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And like the sensors that we have are pretty... Uh pretty basic right now like even some of like my uh vr stuff that i jump into i'll be the first to say like i don't have like an actual headset and stuff yet so i'm kind of like like hopping into these calls through my web browser or my phone or whatever and it's like you know we're all little blobs on the screen but we can you know move around in 3d space we've even got the spatial audio now so if you like walk up to one group of people you can have a conversation but as soon as you like turn and go somewhere else like it like spatially sounds different so like that's kind of cool but yeah, to your point, like, you know, are we ever going to get to the point where we have like full like face, like face data where you, know, you can really give an expression or, or even body language, right? Like we've always sort of been told that like 70% of communication is nonverbal. Um, so I think part of what you're saying, right, is like the accessibility concerns here. Like, you know, are we going to get to a, a world someday where, you know, your full, you know, body is like being scanned in full 3D, like real time. So you can send all of this feedback or, or maybe that's like, even too much. Like I think about like the mute button, for example, like how useful is that? You can kind of like choose when you want to have that sense, like those sensors coming into your life versus nope, I actually want to turn this off right now. Are you going to have that ability with like eye contact or like mouth movements or that type of thing? I don't know. <laughs> okay. There's so much that's coming up for me because there's actually a black mirror episode about how you can like mute people, mm. which is, and you say, are we really ever going to, I think it's a matter of inevitability, you know, like it's a matter of when we will, maybe not in our lifetime, although I can't help but wonder that it might be because it's already happening. And like, 
So I have the goggles and you go in and in the workspaces, you don't actually have to use the the two controllers that come with the VR goggles. In fact, you can program it to pick up your hand movements. And so like, if like someone starts picking their nose, for example, it shows up or you scratch and it shows up. Um, and that's crazy. Like the AI is pretty advanced, advanced enough for me to be like, ah, it can see me and hear me. I yeah. Know, I don't know how to feel about that. Yeah. Cause I think you're hitting on an interesting thing where like part of communication is voluntary and part of it's involuntary, right? Like what if I don't want you to see that I'm picking my nose or what if I have to go run to the bathroom real quick? Like, are you going to see me get up in the metaverse and run to a different room? You know what I mean? Um, so, so yeah, I think some of this is like pretty interesting. What happens in the metaverse as it currently stands is that if you get up out of your uh, workspace, the boundary that you've set, um, you just turn into a blob that just like, just like laser, like a puppet. <laughs> That's so funny. You've been unplugged from the metaverse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like a dead body. And then you bring life back into that dead body because you're the life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so interesting. I mean, in Zoom, right? Like if you need to leave the room for a second, you turn your camera off, you turn your, your microphone off and you kind of stare at a blank, lifeless screen. So I guess in a lot of ways, it's very similar. That yeah. now it's a bit more personified, maybe a little creepy now. <laughs> yeah, you you turn your avatar off, basically. Right, right. Well, even going back to what you sort of said initially about like, what are some sort of ethical concerns with how we're building this, these new communication technologies is really what we're talking about here. I have no doubt that, you know, as we build this stuff, we're going to find issues and we're going to, you know, fix those issues. Um, even I'm thinking about even the technology we're using right now. Like I think uh, Google recently shipped some uh, features to their virtual meeting system where it'll even like adjust your lighting for you and, and give you more, it'll like sort of simulate that you're being front lit a bit more so you can like see your facial expressions better. And all of that's through AI now. Um, and it's it's cool to think that like, okay, like, you know, there's still some some issues here that we're, 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 we're solving, which is cool. Um, for me, I think the biggest thing is like recognizing that I don't think there's going to be like one metaverse or even like two metaverses. Like I think there's going to be like a lot of them. I mean, I think of these as just virtual like hangout spaces. And so I think when I when I think about like what I'm maybe most concerned with or the thing that I'm sort of paying attention to the most is it's like uh, who are building these spaces and, and like why are they building these spaces for us, right? Um, if it's a company, if it's like a private company that's owning this server and this space and it could, it could be like a really cool workspace and maybe they have some crazy incentive program that's got a lot of people coming into this metaverse and hanging out, which is cool. Um, but I think you'd want to ask yourself, like, why does this, you know, private company want me here? Like, how are they benefiting or what's, what's, you know, their interest in mind it might not be bad, but it's just important to know. Right. And so I think maybe one way we can help combat that is to maybe celebrate virtual spaces that are built by each other, like by humans for humans, um, giving you a bit more ownership and control about, this, the this virtual spaces that you you know voluntarily check into every day that you actually want to be there and 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 realizing that um, at the end of the day I think one of the scarcest and most valuable resources is the human attention and that's why you're seeing right now like all of these platforms are trying to hog your attention and I think the metaverse could be uh, similar right where it's probably going to be you know thousands millions of different metaverses you can hang out in obviously there's only so many that you can like actually spend time in. So I think that'll probably manifest itself as well. But if these are at least spaces that I guess we as individuals have a bit more like creative control over, I personally would feel you know very happy, you know, living in this uh, or not living, but like you know, voluntarily maybe every day for work or for my friends or whatever, going into the space, like I create and like my friends have created, I don't know if you've ever played Minecraft, but it's like a similar concept. It's like, if you build this world for yourself, it's, it's truly yours. And it, and it makes it a lot more special to to be there versus, you know, feeling like maybe you're renting space from some private company who wants your eyeballs on their metaverse so they can show you advertisements or whatever. <laughs> um, I, from what I understand, Minecraft, I think was, now don't quote me on this, but I believe it was, it partnered with another company in order to have 
a digital world. Mm. Yes, there's a Minecraft Earth right now, which is like, I think it's a standalone game. Um, but the concept is exactly what you just said. I think, I don't, I don't believe you need any special hardware for it. It might just be like a standard phone. But the concept is you literally go into the real world and it knows where you are based on coordinates. And you can actually build these like Minecraft structures and like put them in the real world. And then when other people go to that spot that are on Minecraft Earth, they can see the the cool thing that you built there. And so to your point, I think that's like a, one of the early cases of of true like sort of augmented reality where here's this classic game beloved by, you know, millions of, of, of young people. And now you're literally bringing it to the real world where you can create like literally physical landmarks that are like Minecraft. It's like, it's like building in like in Legos in real life, except now it's a, a digital thing that you can share with other people. Yes. Okay. So I believe it was Microsoft that uh, partnered with Minecraft in order to create a world of their own. As you said, like, it's not just going to be one metaverse. It's going to be multiple metaverses. I like to refer to them as meta Metavi. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> but like, ultimately there would be like one place very much like the internet. There are not multiple internets. There's this one internet and there are multiple websites. And so there's this one metaverse and there are like multiple different spaces. And now it will no doubt rely on blockchain, blockchain technology and digital assets such as uh, non-fungible tokens, NFTs colloquially to like monetize transactions in the digital environment. My question there for is like, okay, so who's creating this? Like, as you said, like, is it going to be this centralized platform that someone has created where you know just as you said where we then have to question right why does the creator of this person want us want our attention to be here or will it be a decentralized platform where we the people create it as like it is like a self-generating algorithm in a sense mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think it'll probably be a bit of both, right? Like, and even when when you kind of, I like how you laid that distinction out, because in my opinion, I think the internet is about to get rebranded to the metaverse. And the reason I say that is because we think about like what internet means and what it used to mean is it used to literally just be like a text only database that like anybody, well, if you had the right hardware, right, you could tap into this, you know, network of computers and just read information. That's what the internet originally was. Uh, and, and largely today, I mean, it's still reading, but now you can write. And now you have all these platform companies that allow you to post, you know, interesting cat photos and whatever. Um, I think the internet is going to become the metaverse when these websites sort of, as you, as you call it, like, I mean, that's probably what it's going to be, right? Is you just go to a website and then you click, you know, enter metaverse or whatever. Um, you know, those, those services are still going to be there, but they're going to feel realer and realer as the immersion technology gets better and better. And I think that's sort of what we're really talking about here when we say metaverse is like, it's still gonna be on the internet. It's still gonna be run probably over HTTP, at least for a very long time. We're still gonna be using the under underground cables that we've we've laid and stuff. Um, but it's it's going to, it, you know, we, we kind of grew up saying like, oh, you know, go to this, this website, right? Uh, read this page. Our kids might be saying like, go to this room right and like talk to these people um and and so yeah i think that's kind of when i think like you know there there will be obvious there i think there will be centralized services and there, there are going to be some really good ones too um but i think there also will be ones that are sort of built by the community for the community and ultimately it's going to be um if you think about like the attention like a con like human attention as an economy i think it's going to play itself out where you'll see like the, the, the cool centralized metaverses were, are going to attract and retain a lot of attention, a lot of eyeballs, going to be a lot of cool people frequently hanging out there. Um, but I do think too, that there will be other smaller niche communities that pop up where, you know, you might be able to get some other uh, buy-in and you realize, wait a minute, like this is actually more decentralized. And now I'm actually part of a community of people just like me. I'm, I'm not, you know, joining whatever XYZ company's virtual room. I'm in this room that you know, my, my friends created it and I'm actually going to, you know, maybe even write code tonight to like improve it. Right. That, that, that would be the, the coolest thing is to kind of have that, you know, full stack buy-in from your users. But 
Um, yeah, I think I think it's going to be a bit of both, for better or for worse. I'm not sure, you know, which ones are going to stick around the longest, but um, that's what's exciting to me is I think just the the possibilities of of um, you know we're we're sort of discovering this this whole thing for the first time, and I think there's going to be a lot of interesting use cases that come up. Uh, there are two different directions I want to take this conversation. <laughs> Because one of the directions the <laughs> I want to take them is like, it's really out there, but I'm going to go for it. All right. So you say that this is the first time that we're discovering this. Is it because like based on how we're progressing as humanity and how technology is progressing, one could argue that what we consider as base reality, this, that human interaction might already be simulated. Hmm. Yeah, because to a certain extent, we are, um, when you think of like, you know, if, if somebody were to ask you, like, point to me, like, 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 point, point to you, like, like, what is, where is you in your body, right? It's like a little hard, like, is it my heart? Or is it like my brain? Or is it my mouth or my eyeballs, right? Uh, it's, it's hard. And, and to a certain extent, we're sort of like, some sort of, like, us, the, the, the idea of Palvache and the idea of Dylan sort of manifest themselves through our physical bodies every single day. But to your point, I mean, like, you know, that's, that's sort of one way of existing. We're now talking about slapping another front end onto that. So you can still express you, your identity. Um, but now, right. Instead of through your body, it's like through your body, through a computer screen, through literally sending like, you know, uh, internet through like the speeds of light to some other person who's doing the exact same thing on the other side of the world. And I think it's just, to your point, I think it's just another layer of abstraction. Right. It is another layer of abstraction. Cause like, yeah. Cause one could argue that like the world, the reality we live in is an internet of its own. And then each like say location or country or city or whatever is a website or web page of its own. And we are the avatars that move between those rooms. Yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> and like, that's not to say that I don't think like the metaverse is going to replace at all like in person stuff, because I think the real, like the, the real tangible world that we all walk in every single day has a lot of like truly beautiful things and, and beautiful places and, and cultures even. And I don't think you're going to get all of that on the metaverse, um, you know, not for a long time really uh, until like you, we literally have, if we ever have buy in from like all over the world, right? Um, but I think in the, in the shorter term here and now, um, yeah, I think it's going to be more of these kind of like micro like cultures kind of starting to form. And, and I'm not sure what all those use cases are going to be. Like, I think a lot of times, even today, as, as cool as it is to pull up a Zoom and like be able to talk to somebody, sometimes it's just easier to pick up the phone or like just to send a text. You know what I mean? So I, I think these methods are never going to go away. Um, but it does get me thinking like, you know, what, what, um, yeah, I guess what is... What are like the best uses for being in like a 3D space with other people? Okay, so thank you for bringing it back down because this was the other direction. Um, one thing that really comes to mind is that like, so the internet has kind of, is like a use case of its own. And um, one of the things that really comes up is that the metaverse as it currently stands is very much like this marketplace. It's like this, you go and you you buy things for your avatar you have you pay for the services that are within the metaverse you download apps um you customize your environment all of these things um which is kind of like the internet in fact it's very much like the internet another thing that comes up is something like for example pornography now, I was giving a lecture at an AI conference in Vegas about three years ago, and it was really cool. Like, there were a lot of different inventions there. One guy had, like, a robotic arm that you could put, like, stickers on your head and control the arm and play, like, tennis against, like, a backboard. Uh, but the most uh, popular attraction or invention there was VR porn. And so... that that question that you asked, like, what are some of the ways that we could mindfully use this space? Okay, sure, like we could get immersed in something like that. But we could also use it for education. Like, I think VR technology could take something like surgery, or even 
uh, classes for med students or things like exploring uh, astronomy to a different level or even take uh, being able to manipulate um, representations of atoms to understand the fundamental structure of nature itself. I think if we took that to a whole new three-dimensional space, it could be powerful. Yeah, I think for me, like education, I think is like the one that I get most excited about because even even if we look at like you know schools today, a lot of them are moving towards some sort of like Zoom real life hybrid. Um, but you hear kids all the time talk about Zoom fatigue and like mm. you know it, it really is like taxing to like sit in your like front of your computer and like look at a screen that might have your face on it or might not, and just doing that for hours and hours every single day, all day every day. And so I think some people wonder if if the reason that causes fatigue is just because of like kind of how artificial it still is. And like, it's not a very natural way of communicating and it takes a lot of like cognitive energy just to like, you know, go about like, you know, Oh, like, how does my background look? Is there like something in my room or, you know what I mean? There's just so many like little things that I think we're, we're still not really used to. Um, but then like you, you sort of bring it like back to like this metaverse where like, what if we could like, like, sit in a virtual classroom and like I as the student or, or as a teacher can like like walk around a room and like share a space and, and to your point we can talk about these ideas in a virtual space and then bring up these like 3D models of of different things you can like literally pass around the room if you wanted to or um or just like you know project on on like some whiteboard in the metaverse or something. Uh, but yeah I think I think education will be a really interesting one and not not in, in the traditional sense of like a lecturer and then you know, students like taking notes in the metaverse. Yeah. I think it's going to be much more interactive, yes. um, much more like fully like sensory immersive. And you're going to have, I think the, the whole student teacher relationship, I think is really going to change. It's going to be, it's going to feel a lot more um, like corporate-y in the sense that like you, you have a lot more like in-person like meetings and you're kind of jumping around different rooms and like bringing in different people all the time. Um, but I think it's going to be fun because like imagine how cool it would be like if you're studying animals in class and then you can literally just like look at like yeah. you know, a real life, you know, lion or something that's like to scale in front of you in the metaverse in this classroom with you and you can like pet him or whatever. Like you're so sick. <laughs> yeah, it would be so sick. Exactly. Um, you know, you mentioned some things like Zoom fatigue, for example, and that kind of brings me to the fact that like we actually haven't learned how to use the, like the technology called the human body that like and then we're adding another layer of technology and as you were saying earlier it's like another layer of abstraction which causes a lot of noise in our mind that like that's another thing i feel like the metaverse could be really useful for that to interplay mindfulness practices with virtual reality where you get to practice how to use technology consciously like in that moment yes 100 percent. and talk about like being present like even on as i'm like speaking to you right now with the zoom like front and center I've got like my second monitor here and I've got like other screens over here yeah. and like my emails like right here at all times. You know what I mean? Like there's so many like things that could just pull my focus quickly away. Whereas to your point, if you're like fully immersed in this 3D space, you know, that is your experience. And so suddenly it becomes much like harder to like check your phone during a meeting because everybody can see you pull out your phone and you know what I mean? But like, maybe that's a good thing. Like maybe that helps to encourage people to be a bit more present with each other, even when connecting through technology in these like virtual spaces. I think it's kind of funny to I me mean, to your point, like we are just kind of like clumsy apes that are like, you know, now putting on these like headsets and like trying to figure out like, how do we exist in a virtual space? When to your point, we're still, a lot of us are trying to figure out how to exist in real life, you know? <laughs> and I think, I think part of that, which is kind of funny and, and I don't really know how the metaverse will take hold, but I think the reason it's so attractive, like you just said to sort of, um, you know, customize your virtual avatar with these items and maybe these collectibles even, right? Um, it's just like different ways of self-expression. And um, if you think about like when you wake up every morning, the clothing that you choose to put on your body is sort of like your way of like just expressing yourself to the rest of the world. And 
being able to to do that in the metaverse, even through some sort of avatar, might be like that pass through that that some people need, where you know, maybe they can feel comfortable in this virtual body enough to then feel willing to go into a virtual space and practice all of these sort of mindfulness social cues that we like we talked about in a way where maybe you know you're a real person with your real clothes like you don't feel quite as confident or or maybe there's something else going on so i think that's kind of interesting too i suppose yes it can add that layer of anonymity which can perhaps allow you to be more authentic now with that said i did read this um article um where this individual was writing about how they can't wait for the metaverse because they don't like their real life. Mm. And so I can't help but wonder that all of these things, these the self-expression, like being involved in these spaces are to some degree a distraction from reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the only piece of what you just said that I think I wouldn't fully agree on is, is the distraction from reality, only because... And yeah, this is where we have to be careful because like, um, especially if you think about like young, young men, especially um, very, very inclined to get sucked into video games for a long period of time. And there's a number of like psychological reasons why it affects like boys predominantly that we don't really necessarily have to go into. But it's all about, to your point, like finding like value in like in the live in like living th in this digital community with other people who also find value in being there too. And I think in the game, in like the case of video games, you know, our society might look at that as like, you know, you're, you're spending, wasting, using time on this video game. Um, but to what you just said is very interesting because imagine now society sort of gets gamified a little bit into this metaverse where you can have this virtual character and you can, you know, uh, buy with like real money, these like, you know, expensive, you know, virtual clothes. And then based on like the brands that you're wearing on your avatar, people will, you know, sort of have a sense for like status and whatever. Um, but then, you know, like, I think that that can be productive if all of society is sort of like bought into living in this, in this metaverse and that we're all like building stuff together and contributing. And like, maybe like we literally build a second, like a virtual economy on top of our like physical one. Like that would be really interesting. But then to your point, what happens when it's like so much more fun to be in the metaverse with your friends and with all of these, you know, I can, I can like jump 50 stories and I can like build, build a really cool building just by like, you know, waving my hand or whatever, literally at like being gods and then like coming into now, you know, oh, you know, I got to sign off for the day and now I'm just little old me. Right. Um, and I, I... <laughs> Actually, um, a quote by Edward Wilson, he writes about this, how we have paleolithic hardwiring and we still live in medieval social structures and now we've layered it with godlike technology. They're like, are we, are we ready for this? That, and if but we want to bridge that gap between the evolution of technology and the evolution of consciousness itself, that like we need to kind of make some sort of effort in educating on how this affects us. That like we have enough research to show that blue light and technology, the dopamine hits that we get from notifications, they're more addictive than nicotine and alcohol combined. And both of those things have age limits on them. And so like, what do we do when addressing something like this in the metaverse, especially since morals and ethics vary across communities, across religions, across cultures? Although one thing you did that does keep coming up in our conversation is community. And I do have to say that like at the center of it all, it does seem like our collective value as the whole of humanity for connection is to some degree driving this that you know i do a values activity with my clients and across the board while many values vary from individual to individual across the board every single person i've come across values connection and growth yeah 100 percent. i think it's it's almost like a core core driver of anything we do as humans is to is to bond with other humans right seek that social connection um 
doing things with other people is generally way more fun than doing it by yourself. And I think, I think to your point, um, where it's, it's interesting to be having this conversation because it does feel like we're sort of on the cusp of this next, you know, big technological, um, revolution. And to your point, every new technology that we make, we give ourselves more power. Um, and even now we're talking about like metaverses where, you know, you can be, uh, in a, you know, uh, a, a room with like your, uh, your team for your company and you're working on like the next, you know, product release or whatever it is you're doing, but you can do this in like a 3d space. And then you can like, maybe bring like your pet rhinoceros with you or something, you know what I mean? Like, it doesn't like, like, like it, it'll be, it'll be interesting in, in that sense. Um, I think, I think we're, I think like what we're doing here today is, is good. Like, I think we need people to be just talking about this. Um, I tend to be more optimistic in the sense of, I've noticed that human beings are extremely good at adapting to change. Um, and I think that's what's let us do this crazy, crazy exponential technology innovations over the last like 30, 40, 50 years. And, and to your point, even though you know, mentally, you know, we're still like animals and we still sort of behave like medieval times in, in, in some ways, um, we, we obviously have a knack for this stuff. And, and it's crazy, like, like the human brain hasn't really changed I mean, the, the body even, but the brain too hasn't really changed much in the last 40,000 years. So like conceptually, you could go and give like a caveman, like an iPad and like they can figure it out like exactly like you did. Now, obviously there's a lot of like steps to to go to, to get there, but it's not like there's anything special or unique or different about humans now versus humans, you know, a hundred years ago. Like we're biologically exactly the same, but I think it's interesting that we are very good at adapting to change. And I think, this metaverse stuff is going to sound weird to some people. Eventually, it's going to proliferate into the mainstream. You're going to start having, I mean, even stuff like, um, like Fortnite. Didn't Fortnite have like a, a DJ uh, uh, that like came and like did Marshmallow? I think like did like this, <laughs> literally like like he did a set. Like he performed a, a an EDM set, and there were probably like thousands of people all over the world that had their headphones on and were bumping and having a great time. But they did it like in Fortnite. And like, I know like Roblox is another like kind of platformer game and, and they have like literally like, in, like, like metaverse type events happening over there as well. So you see it coming up everywhere. I think it's just going to continue breaking into society more and more. And I think what we have to do as people is to just make sure that this is a conscious thing that it doesn't sneak up on us to your point. And then, you know, 20, 30 years from now, we're like, whoa, like, you know, we went about this all wrong and now everybody's like addicted to the metaverse. You know what I mean? Like, I think if we can be more conscious and and have these types of conversations now we can at least develop this technology with like a bit more i guess like sensitivity toward these issues yeah and awareness so in that way i'm actually really optimistic because i have a theory i have a theory that this all this whole like this wave of technology actually has to happen in order for our brains and our consciousness to evolve to the next stage because think about it, everything we've been talking about, most of the ethical concerns in the metaverse are also issues for non-digital life, such as privacy, social and economic inequalities, accessibility, identity control, freedom of creative expression, etc. And so they're not really new issues, they merely reflect society as it is. So as far as the big picture is concerned, ethical problems have always existed. Humanity has only recently begun to attempt to address many of them. And so like we've started to address many of them because now we're the technology we're creating is a reflection of us. Yeah. It is an extension of us. This AI is an extension of how we view the world as the as the observer itself. And so now yeah. we can observe our behavior. And before you can ch make change, you have to observe the, what's going on. So I think that's really the silver lining that in that way, I, I, I'm actually really optimistic. I genuinely don't believe that we're going to be a society that's going to be addicted because people like you and me are already talking about the stuff. The seeds are already being planted as to, okay, well, this is actually not about just the metaverse. Yeah, I mean, what like what like a uh, an uh, an opportunity, right? Like, I yeah. think any any technology that we build, like the technology piece, 
is agnostic. It's a tool. It's a thing. Um, it doesn't, but all, all that technology, and I'm, I'm using technology like very broadly. Like I think in this specific context, we're talking more about computers and like that type of thing. But I'm, I'm, I mean, like all technology, including like back when the first humans figured out that like you can plant seeds and like grow a tree and like you don't have to walk 10 miles to get your food. You can literally get food like right here. Um, like that's technology too. Um, when you think about all technology that humans have built, all it does is just amplify everything that is already there as us all all of these issues that you're, you're talking about are not old issues they've been issues as long as we've been forming societies what technology does is it is it amplifies those dramatically which to your point can be dangerous but it also provides us with a lens in which we can look at ourselves and say okay wait a minute these are issues we've had all along we've sort of brushed it under the rug because of one reason or another this technology has ultimately done xyz amazing things to humanity but it's also introduced all these other problems but maybe like we needed to have those problems exposed on such a large scale through technology to like have the collective consciousness as like a as a society as a shared humanity to actually come together and like work towards solutions and a lot of these solutions we might be able to figure out with more technology which is kind of like the interesting thing and so i think i think to double down on the sentiment it's really more about um, the attitude we have when developing this technology. I don't think it's something we should be afraid of. I don't think it's something that we should be fighting. I think it's something that we should we should accept with open arms, but also realize that like the work isn't done. And that with every new innovation we create, we're solving a whole bunch of problems and we're also going to be creating a bunch of other problems. But ultimately, the new problems that we have are better than the old problems. <laughs> and so I think I think that's kind of the uh, the uh, um the treadmill of progress, as, as you might call for uh, humanity. As you were saying all of that, what was really coming up for me is that it's the our AI and the metaverse and the internet, it's a solid reflection of humanity as a whole. It is just the mirror we needed. That like, because we are intricate, complex human beings and we needed a mirror that was equally intricate and complex to show us our reflection in order to make the changes that we desire. Because I don't necessarily like to view the world as like problems that need to be fixed. Like everything is as it is. Like even concepts of good and bad are just things that we've created, we've assigned labels to. So there are situations that we've created and we have the power to change them accordingly. Yeah, exactly. And I think just being mindful about that too, like realizing, I mean, even something we talked about earlier on uh, in this, in this podcast is just that like, you know, just because we want a metaverse doesn't mean that like everybody in the world wants a metaverse. <laughs> and it also doesn't necessarily mean that they want to be in the same one as us. Right. And so I think recognizing that, you know, there's a lot of technologies, metaverse and, and others um, that, you know, we as I guess Westerners could have a certain very strong perspective on, but just realizing that, like, look, we're building new technology that's going to impact the entire world, you know, whether we like it or not. Everything is so interconnected, right? And so let's just be mindful of that. You know, we don't have to like not innovate, but let's just innovate in a way that like we're being mindful of the people who might have some downstream consequences, good or or not, right? Yes, exactly. Wow, Dylan, this was such a, an amazing, mind-bending conversation. <laughs> I feel like I used my brain really intentionally for this conversation. My technology. <laughs> yes, but, yes, yeah. It's it's cool. It's it's a little overwhelming, um, but I mean, hey, you know, we're we're all humans. We're all here doing this thing together, and um, I'm I'm appreciative of people like you uh, for for kind of helping to to uh, I guess create these conversations because if it's if, if if we don't if we don't start and we don't have these conversations now I mean who who will right exactly all right Dylan this was amazing thank you so much for coming on my show is there anything you would like to leave the listeners off with man well I uh, appreciate you having me this was awesome I think I think one theme I'll just echo because I think it's super important um, that we're talking about is just general mindfulness. You know, whatever it is you're doing, whenever you log into your next metaverse or you're thinking about joining a new one or whatever the case may be, 
Um, I think just always approaching it very mindfully and just wondering, you know, I guess, yeah, asking yourself anything that we kind of discussed on this call um, and sort of bearing in mind that it is always a work in progress, but that ultimately we're humans, we're flawed humans, but we're all flawed together and we're all sort of um, finding new ways to, to connect. Um, and I guess just get back to like, you know, the purpose of being a human is just to connect and have fun. Yeah. Like, you know, if everything was perfect, what would we do? I would go crazy. <laughs> I'd like break <laughs> something just so I could go fix it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All right, Dylan, if more people want to find out about what you're doing, where can they find you? Sure. Yeah. Um, great question. I'm mostly active on Twitter these days, um, but I'm also sort of prodding around on LinkedIn too. Um, some of these platforms are just getting so crazy. Talk about like platform companies that are like hogging for your attention, but I like Twitter. Uh, Twitter is like a nice way for me to kind of like express how I feel to the world. Um, and at some point I'm thinking about doing some type of like more formal newsletter type situation, but I'll keep you posted on that. All right. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me.